Right. I'll tell you the first thing that anyone hears when they walk into my agency. Hello and welcome to the Literary Lair, and welcome back to Blockbuster Month. I'm a detective, but not in the traditional sense. My job is to investigate books, novels, short stories, prose, and I have to figure out if they're good or not and why. It's not a lucrative gig, but it makes me happy, and that's what counts, eh? It was the third week of June, possibly the fourth depending on how fast I ended up editing this. That's when I took on the most complicated case of my career. Who Framed Roger Rabbit? is one of the most beloved live-action animated hybrid films of all time. A childhood favorite of mine, in fact. I even owned the movie on VHS, something I've held on to since I was a kid. But not many people know that it was actually based on a novel, and it's my job to show people what the novel was all about. Naturally, the most striking change is obvious from the name. While the movie was Who Framed Roger Rabbit, the novel was called Who Censored Roger Rabbit. Censored being the tune equivalent of murder. That's right, Roger Rabbit's been off before we even opened the case. But that's not even the biggest change. No, the biggest change comes once you get inside the book. Before I go into the content, though, I have to talk about how it looks. They say you should never judge a book by its cover, but it's very hard to do that with this one. The cover is very distinct and striking. Roger himself looks horrifying next to the rather normal-looking Eddie Valiant. The thing about Disney is that Disney is very particular about designs, and everything they make has a cutesy slant to it. That makes it sort of endearing, certain exceptions aside. Not so with this cover. Roger looks very uncanny valley, like he's a short dude in an animal costume. I think it's the big, wide-open eyes that bother me the most. They look like they're staring into my soul. Roger and Eddie Valiant are standing near a tall Art Deco style building, which sort of reminds me of CCPD from the CW Flash series, while Roger says, Help! I'm stuck in a mystery at Double Crosses, Steamy Broads, and Killer Cream Pies. The title is up top with the author, Gary Wolf, who is known for other comedic humor type stories, and the tagline claims that it's a cross between Sam Spade and Looney Tunes, and it's a cult classic. I'll be the judge of that. I will say, personal qualms with Roger's look aside, I love the design of this cover. The artwork is beautiful, and putting all the title, author, and tagline stuff at the top of the sky is a very good utilization of the white space. On to what you came here for. The Case. Our case revolves around Eddie Valiant, a human detective who works in a world where cartoon characters coexist with humans, but are second-class citizens, being relegated to their own segregated parts of town, and with there being a lot of discrimination abound, like human and tune-only clubs and establishments. Valiant doesn't like tunes, not because of a tragic backstory involving his brother being murdered by one, but just a personal preference because tunes like dames or nothing but trouble. Valiant is hired by Roger Rabbit, famed second banana to baby Herman, who believes that the DeGreasy brothers, two humans named Rocco and Dominic, not those ones, who own the comic syndicate that he's hired by, have some ulterior motive in not giving him a starring role or releasing him from his contract to a buyer. Valiant takes the case, but really only for the money, because Roger offers a generous retainer further proving that people like Valiant and me will do just about anything for a paycheck. Valiant checks the leads, but comes up with nothing. The DeGreasies simply state that Roger isn't talented enough, which Valiant takes at face value, having met the guy. And he visits all the important players in the case, Baby Herman, the character that Roger plays sidekick to, who, like the version in the film, has a 50-year-old lust and a 3-year-old dinky. The photographer, Carol Masters, and Rocco and Roger's ex-wife, Jessica, learning from Jessica about doppels. See, unlike the movie, tunes can die, and for dangerous stunts, the tunes don't throw themselves onto the line of fire. They create short-lived clones that disintegrate within a few hours. Now, this could open up an entire can of worms for the morality of creating a being destined only to die, but the book never really broaches the subject in any real depth. During the talk with Jessica, Eddie finds out that Jessica divorced Roger after a year of marital bliss, which Roger thinks is related to the DeGreasies, though Jessica affirms several times that she chose to leave by her own accord, 
and she never truly loved Roger. Valiant's case takes a turn for the interesting when Roger claims that he was threatened with murder, but Valiant, being a skilled detective, finds that Roger faked the attempt on his own life to keep Valiant on the case. Valiant goes to confront Roger and drop the case, but instead he finds Roger dead in his home, having been shot with a large gun, but there was no sign of forced entry. To make matters more confusing, Roger is also a person of interest in the murder of Rocco de Grisi, who was murdered a few short hours before Roger. The way the cops see it is this, Roger killed Rocco, went home, Jessica found out and killed Roger in retaliation due to Roger's last words and the deflated word balloon being Jessica. Valiant returns to his office to put the case and the best part of a bottle of whiskey behind him, but instead finds his office broken into. By Roger Rabbit. Except it's not Roger, it's his doppel, created to go out and find a pair of suspenders in the middle of the night when he was murdered. Suspicious, but Roger was a nut, so Eddie writes it off. The doppel pleads with Valiant to finish off the case and find the real killer, who he insists cannot be Jessica, and Valiant agrees to take Roger's doppel on as his protege for the remainder of his existence. To make things easier, I'm going to refer to the doppel as Roger since he's the same guy, and it really doesn't make sense to distinguish between the two of them for the sake of the plot. Valiant begins grilling the suspects, Dominic de Greasy, Rocco's son, Little Rock, who was having a dispute with his father and had motive to kill him, and Carol, who all have rock-solid alibis, save for Jessica Rabbit, and who all mention a certain tea kettle that they all want to get from Roger's possessions once they're released. Roger tells Valiant that the tea kettle is nothing special, but they start to track it down anyway, and it turns out that Carol had found it on the street outside Roger's house, and Roger and Eddie go to figure out the history behind the kettle. There are a bunch of side stories that take center stage while Valiant and Roger try to solve the case of the kettle and the murders, finding that Carol and Little Rock were in cahoots together in a forgery scheme to make money off of Rocco, and there are a lot of tangents dedicated to unraveling the mystery of the tea kettle. But I'll save you the trouble. The gist is that the tea kettle is rumored to be a magic lamp. Valiant starts to tolerate having Roger around and grows to appreciate his input. Everything comes to a head when Valiant learns from Jessica that the kettle is indeed a magic lamp, that she had heard about it when she was married to Rocco. Turns out Rocco and Dominic had used the lamp years ago to wish themselves into being humans. Yeah, Rocco and Dominic were tunes the entire time, and they created the syndicate that made them rich, but when everything went sour, they wanted to find the lamp again so that they could undo all of the problems that they had. Jessica claims that she saw Roger kill Rocco and then went to bargain for the lamp, but when Roger tricked her into going into the bedroom in an attempt to seduce her, she was out of the room when Roger's killer showed up and killed him. She was there, but she never saw the killer, who vanished as quickly as they arrived. Roger gives the kettle to Valiant before getting arrested when the cops discover the doppel exists, since he revealed himself to Jessica in an attempt to get her to admit her love for him, which she wholeheartedly refused, saying that she never loved him, and the cops want to interrogate him. Valiant takes the lamp to Dominic, but when Valiant leaves the room and prepares to go home, Dominic is murdered by the genie of the lamp. Man, this new Aladdin remake is weird. Valiant confronts the genie, who reveals that indeed he was the mastermind behind Roger's killing. Frustrated with being in the lamp for centuries, the genie, like many in fiction, decided to get creative and with the granting of its wishes, giving the DeGreases their wish to become human and rich, but their syndicate would fail within a few years. Roger had inadvertently, due to accidentally saying the trigger phrase while singing a song, in this, instead of rubbing a potential master needs a special phrase to release the genie, made wishes to get his contract and marry Jessica, but like with the DeGreases, the genie booby-trapped those wishes too, making him a perennial second banana and having Jessica be infatuated with him, but only for a single year, and then she'd despise him forever. Roger accidentally triggered it the night of the murder, and for the first time, because he was in the room, saw the genie, who revealed that all his good fortune was because of him, and then the genie shot him with a blunderbuss. Hence the last words, he was expressing surprise that Jessica's love was due to magical interference. 
Valian had met with an antiques expert earlier who learned that genies could be destroyed by salt water. And Dominic happens to have a saltwater fish tank in the office. Valiant threatens the genie and demands a single wish, conclusive proof that Dominic de Greasy murdered Rocco, Roger, and then himself, which the genie reluctantly grants before Valiant destroys him anyway, since genies, like toons and dames, are nothing but trouble. Roger is released from custody and sits with Valiant as he nears the end, and Valiant reveals that he's figured out that Roger did kill Rocco. Hence the doppel, giving him an airtight alibi since somebody saw him by the suspenders. And in a primal fear-esque twist, Roger reveals that Valiant was absolutely correct. And the reason that he had initially broken into Valiant's office was because he was going to plant the gun he used to kill Rocco and use Valiant as a patsy. But the genie screwed everything up as he finally disintegrates leaving Eddie Valiant alone in his office to reflect on the outcomes of the case. Unlike the last two cases we covered, the book is an entirely different story than the film adaptation, save for certain characters appearing and having similar characterizations. If you've seen the film, you know what I'm talking about. No R.K. Maroon, no Judge Doom, no Weasels, no Dip. Sort of like that Dirk Gently adaptation that Max Landis did, that only bothered to use the name Dirk Gently and retold everything else until it was unrecognizable as a Douglas Adams story. Except that Roger Rabbit is actually a good adaptation. Eddie Valiant, save for his tragic backstory not existing, is essentially the same character. An ornery detective dealing with a dope partner until the very end, where he admits to actually enjoying his company. The major difference is that while Eddie has several women show an interest in him, he doesn't have a major love interest like in the film, where that role was filled by Dolores, though Eddie had a few moments with Jessica and Carol. Baby Herman is also basically the same, and has about the same role here, testifying to Eddie about Roger. Jessica Rabbit isn't the likable character in a bad situation she was in the movie. She's a gold-digging opportunistic, and above all, mean woman. She was opportunistic and ready to do whatever she needed to do to make money, which is a shame given that the film's version was progressive for the time. But she has the same sort of sexualization and even comes on the Eddie a few times to try to get the lamp from him, uh, though of course being the stoic detective, his morals shine through and stop her. Roger is similar to his characterization in the movie, eager, enthusiastic, but with a darker twist at the end, giving the book a primal fear sort of vibe, since he was the one who killed Rocco de Greasy. Not quite the innocent rabbit we came to sympathize with, and given that I loved primal fear, this was a very welcome twist, and one that I never expected. The doppel was created with the express purpose of being an alibi. Roger just didn't intend on being killed by the genie. Speaking of doppels, perhaps the biggest change is that toons can die without the use of a special toxin, and can be killed by normal guns in dangerous situations, requiring doppels to survive stunts and the like. Definitely puts higher stakes onto the story since anyone, toon or human, is capable of dying by gunshot. Apart from the major stuff, the book includes a more of a focus on comic strip characters as opposed to cartoon characters. So instead of seeing Daffy and Donald, we get Hagar the Horrible and Dick Tracy. Which is actually kind of funny considering that Disney also made a movie based on Tracy. As someone who grew up reading the comics pages in the paper, I found that to be pretty interesting. The changes all really made sense when you remember that Disney made it. Still horrific, but in that Disney sort of nightmare fuel, pants crappingly terrifying way, rather than the straightforward murder mystery. Still a noir parody, but a different sort of parody. And it kind of streamlined the story and gave us a proper villain. Much like Forrest Gump, the movie also made a lot of changes to the title character, in this case turning him into an Aaron Stampler-type character who actually did commit a crime and was not framed as the movie suggested. And like Forrest Gump, I think it makes it supremely more interesting. Roger Rabbit is fine on his own as a lovable dope, but having Valiant simultaneously win and lose because he solves the case and puts it behind him? but also loses because he puts his faith in the culprit instead of a victim, it was really cool how Roger was actually a genius behind his facade of incompetence. Gives the character an entirely new dimension that the movie lacks by making Roger a genuinely nice person, again like in Forrest Gump, where it's more cynical certainly, but fascinating in its own right. 
I liked Eddie Valiant. I was really invested in the case, and since the book is told within his narration, we learn a lot about him. Without the tragic backstory involving his brother, he's more of a run-of-the-mill, cut-and-dry detective, but he's not without his interesting traits, and his insights are extremely well-written. Valiant was a lot nicer to the tunes in this version since he lacked his tragic backstory, which only serves to make him more likable since his dislike of tunes is based on personal experiences with jerk tunes and not an overarching hatred. Maybe it's because I've been in, inve in an investigative mood since Elementary's final season is back and having just picked up the Phoenix Wright collection, but I had a lot of fun trying to solve the case alongside Valiant, and I like being inside the head of a somewhat master detective. Hey, he did figure out it was Roger at the end, didn't he? On the other hand, I hated Jessica. In the film, she was great, but here, she's a gold-digging opportunistic woman who's out for nobody but herself, which is all fine and good in the service of the story to create motive and opportunity, but that doesn't mean I have to like her. I imagine that this was Wolf's method of copying similarly duplicitous women from Pulp Noir, the type of women that Frank Miller tries to put into his modern stories. In the film, she was truly just drawn that way, but in the novel, she's just bad. The villains were also interesting, the twist about the degreases was done really well, and there were a lot of hints that I didn't pick up on, especially given Rocco's love of Jessica, which makes sense if he was a tune at heart. The genie was a bit of a cop-out, but it's the only answer that really makes sense when you lay all the cards on the table. And in fairness, this is the one case where a wizard did it is actually a valid explanation, since with all the other craziness, that's just par for the course in Toontown. The side characters were all interesting, and I liked all their stories, especially the forgery plot with Little Rock and Carol, and Baby Herman was great, though there was very little of him, which was a shame because he's by far the funniest character in either version. The book gets convoluted at some parts, especially as the mystery deepened and more is added on to an already overloaded story, but it is never dull and always page turning. True story, I was reading this on the bus home one day and I was about 15 pages from the end, and I walked down my block reading the book like this because I was hoping that I could finish it before I made it to the front door. Unfortunately, I walk fast, so I ended up finishing it inside. But still, that should tell you how good the book is, because I very rarely do that sort of thing unless I'm really invested. The pacing was great, and I never felt like it dragged or went off on unnecessary tangents. Like the cover utilized the white space, this book made extremely good use of the page real estate. I will admit that the ending could have been more fleshed out, and that type of ending is typical of noirs, so I'm okay with it, and it reinforces the primal fear vibes, since that movie just ended on the reveal as well. I tell ya, this book... Who Censored Roger Rabbit is the kind of book you bring home to meet your mother. The kind that makes a man want to give up reviewing and retire to the beach with it. It is absolutely balls to the wall insane, overly written with dialogue that feels like someone ate all the popular noir movies and vomited them up. But that's all by design because it's meant to parody those elements. And it does so expertly. Like Forrest Gump, the book is a satire, but it's more of an overblown parody of a hard-boiled detective noir-style antics than Forrest Gump was of history. Normally, I'd hate a book that's so convoluted and crazy, but in the case of Roger Rabbit, the book is meant to evoke the feeling of an overblown story, and it succeeds at doing so. So much so that I read an article online where somebody said that the first time they read it, they bailed because the writing was so overdone, not realizing at the time that it was entirely intentional. I think the best part is Roger, namely because it's such an utterly unexpected twist. Even if the cops were saying that he killed Rocco from the start, it's very different than the film that was made based on it, but both versions tell a great story for the medium they represent. Next time, Blockbuster Month concludes with a movie based on a short story that was also expanded into a novel that was released around the same time as the movie, and, uh, I'll explain more next week. See you next time.
Our case revolves around Eddie Valiant, a human detect- oh shit. Sink. Check.